What do you think about uh, sort of Feynman's teaching style or another perspective is of use of uh, visualization? Well, his teaching style is interesting because people have described like the Feynman effect where while you're watching his lectures or while you're reading his lectures, everything makes such perfect sense. So as an entertainment session, it's wonderful because it gives you this um, this intellectual satisfaction that you don't get from anywhere else that you like finally understand it. But the Feynman effect is that you can't really recall what it is that gave you that insight, you know, even a week later. And this is um, this is true of a lot of books and a lot of lectures where the retention is never quite what we hope it is. Um, so there is a risk that uh, the stuff that I do also fits that same bill, where at best it's giving this kind of intellectual candy on giving a glimpse of feeling like you understand something. But unless you do something active, like reinventing it yourself, like doing problems um, to solidify it, um, even things like space repetition memory to just make sure that you have like the building blocks of what do all the terms mean. Unless you're doing something like that, it's not actually going to stick. So the very same thing that's so admirable about Feynman's lectures, which is how damn satisfying they are to consume, might actually also reveal a little bit of the flaw that we should, as educators, all look out for, which is that that does not correlate with long-term learning. We'll talk about it a little bit, I think. Well, you've done some interactive stuff stuff. I mean, even in your videos, the awesome thing that Feynman couldn't do at the time is you could, since it's programmed, you can like tinker, like play with stuff. You could take this value and change it. You can like, here, let's take the value of this variable and change it to build up an intuition, to move along a surface or to, to change the shape of something. I think that's almost a, an equivalent of you doing it yourself, it's not quite there, but you as a viewer, um, yeah. Do you think there's some value in that interactive element? Yeah, well, so what's interesting is you're saying that, and the videos are non-interactive in the sense that there's a play button and a pause button. Um, and you could ask like, hey, while you're programming these things, why don't you program it into an interactable version that, you know, make it a Jupyter notebook that people can play with, which I should do, and that like would be better. I think the thing about interactives though, is most people consuming them, um, just sort of consume what the author had in mind. Uh, and that's kind of what they want. Like I, I have a ton of friends who make interactive explanations. And when you look into the analytics of how people use them, there's a small sliver that genuinely use it as a playground to have experiments. And maybe that small sliver is actually who you're targeting and the rest don't matter. Um, but most people consume it just as a piece of um, like well-constructed literature that maybe you tweak with the example a little bit to see what it's getting at. But in that way, I do think like a video can get most of the benefits of the interactive, like the interactive um, app, as long as you make the interactive for yourself and you decide what the best narrative to spin is. Um, as a more concrete example, like my process with, I made this video about um, SIR models for epidemics. And it's like this agent-based bottling thing where you tweak some things about how the epidemic spreads and you want to see how that affects its evolution. Um, my, my, uh, format for making that was very different than others, where rather than scripting it ahead of time, I just made the playground, and then I played a bunch, uh, and then I saw what stories there were to tell within that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's cool. So your, your video had that kind of structure. It had uh, like five or six stories or whatever it was, and like it was basically, okay, here's a simulation, here's a model. What can we discover with this model? And here's five things I found after playing with it. <laughs> <laughs> well, because here the thing is, a way that you could do that project is you make the model and then you put it out and you say, here's a thing for yeah. the world to play with. Like come to my website where you interact with this thing. Um, and, and people did like sort of remake it in a um, JavaScript way so that you can go to that website and you can test your own hypotheses. But I think a meaningful part of the value to add is not just the technology, but to give the story around it as well. And like, that's kind of my job. It's not just to like make the, uh, the visuals that someone will look at. It's to be the one to decide what's the interesting thing to walk through here. Um, and even though there's lots of other interesting paths that one could take, that can be kind of daunting when you're just sitting there in a sandbox and you're given this tool with like five different sliders and you're told to like play and discover things. It's like, wh where do you do? What do you start? What are my hypotheses? What should I be asking? Yeah. Like a little bit of guidance in that direction can be what actually sparks curiosity to make someone want to um, imagine more about it. 